Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, look with me to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, I want you to see with me uh, the 10th chapter, if you will. Uh, we're going to be looking at an amazing confrontation uh, that a young man had with Jesus. You know, people were always amazed uh, with Jesus. They, they were amazed at his teaching. They were amazed at his miracles. They were amazed at his compassion. And they just uh, worked really hard to, to be around him. Um, this morning, I, I really want to kind of help us to identify where we are on our spiritual journey with the Lord. Uh, some of you are here this morning and <clears throat> you've heard about Jesus, but the fact of the matter is you're a little bit confused about him. Uh, you're, 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 you, you, you've seen people that uh, they've got this uh, cross hanging around their neck and uh, you may have even used his name uh, somewhere in the process of conversations in some kind of context. Uh, but you still wonder, why do people go to church? Uh, what difference can Jesus make in somebody's life? And you're confused about him somewhat. Confusion will do a couple of things. Confusion will lead to apathy and indifference. Or it will also cause a person to be curious. That would carry you a little further in that discussion about who he is and what difference can he make in a person's life. Uh, there are some people that have heard about Jesus, but the uh, fact of the matter is they've rejected Jesus because they cannot wrap their head around the fact that somehow that Jesus could be God and somehow he could make uh, an eternal difference in somebody's life. And uh, so they just reject the idea that uh, Jesus could have any effect whatsoever uh, in a person um, and where they're going to spend eternity. And then there are people who have accepted Jesus Christ and received him into their heart. There was a time in their life that uh, the searchlight of the Holy Spirit kind of revealed to them who they really were and uh, they saw the, the, the difference that Jesus could make in a person's life and they saw the fact that uh, there were some things in their life that had to be dealt with uh, as they would come to faith in Christ. Uh, they are card-carrying, certified, born-again believers, and they got their card in their billfold. They got a little sticker maybe uh, on the back of their car. They possibly even own a Bible. Uh, but uh, prayer time, they pray about every other Super Bowl. Uh, and, and, and Jesus has made very little difference in transformation uh, in their life. Now, um, you know, there are two extremes to that. Is that extreme, that card-carrying person. But then there are the Jesus Junior people out there that, that just, man, they're radically saved and radically different. Uh, and, and, and everybody else is, all the other believers are somewhere uh, in between those two spectrums. I, I'm, I'm just glad you're all here. Uh, I'm glad God brought you to this place because you and I are going to be looking this morning at an interesting encounter uh, that Jesus had with the rich young ruler uh, in Mark chapter 10. Now, uh, redundancy is really a pretty good tool to use when you're teaching. And uh, you've, you hear a lot about my testimony, how that I was growing up, one of, the, one of the great desires of my heart was to excel at something. Uh, and, and I wanted to be great at something. The problem is I really wasn't willing to pay the price to help achieve greatness. Now, a lot of that desire to be great has really bled over into my adult life. I want to be a great daddy. I want to be a great husband. I, I want to be a great pastor. Uh, I want to pastor a great uh, church. So, you know, that... That desire is still prevalent. I've come to this conclusion, and I want you to hear this statement. Jesus did not come and wrap himself up in human flesh to live among us sinlessly, to die on a cross, to take your place and my place on that cross, 
and to rise from the dead just so you and I could live mediocre lives. He did not. Now, the problem with most of us when we come to faith in Christ is that, you know, we just want a quick fix. Just sprinkle some woeful dust uh, out over me and let me be a great Christian. We, we want the Dr. Phil approach. You know, people go to Dr. Phil with these humongous problems and, and Dr. Phil's just got this step-by-step -step easy approach. Just here, you do this and you're going to have a great marriage and great life, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you and I were honest with each other and honest with God, the overwhelming number of people in this room have a desire for something more than what you're experiencing. The overwhelming number of people in this room have a desire for something deeper uh, in your life. The overwhelming number of the people in this room, I am convinced, want their lives uh, to matter. You don't want to be a blasé dad or a mom. Uh, you don't want to be insignificant. You don't want to be wrapped up in some kind of career that brings absolutely no fulfillment to you uh, in your life. You, you really don't want average friendships. You really don't want a routine marriage. You want something much more significant than that. Well, this encounter with a rich man may help us get there um, because it does show us the road to greatness. Matter of fact, it is so significant in the word, God put it in here three times, in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. And, and so if he put it in all three of those gospels, there's something here that he wants us to find. Now, I don't have a flowery outline that I'm going to give you this morning. We're just going to dig in and go verse by verse uh, through this encounter just to see what God is going to say to us. I want you to pick it up with me now in verse number 17. Luke 10, verse 17. When he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now notice this old boy as he's come running up to Jesus. He didn't stay in the background of the multitudes that had followed the Lord. Uh, he wasn't just there waiting to sneak up on Jesus so he could touch the hem of his garment. No, he came running up to Jesus full of an attitude, full of passion, and full of ambition. Today, uh, if we were to put it in 21st century vernacular, we would say that this old boy was the personification of an alpha male. We, we would find him uh, in our culture today. He would be on Survivor, The Amazing Race, and The Apprentice all at the same time. He'd be in all of them. That's the kind of guy that he was. So he comes running up to Jesus. His chest is heaving, and he's out of breath, and he asks the most important question that anybody could ever ask. And my guess is, when he said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? My guess is he wanted a quick fix to his problem. He, he wanted Jesus to somehow give him a, an 11th command. He, he wanted some kind of easy spiritual plan, step by step, that Jesus would just unfold and he could snap his way through it and poof, he would have eternal life. But watch what happens in verse 18. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. You, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, uh, don't defraud, and be sure you honor your father uh, and your mother. So Jesus, being the good rabbi that he is, uh, did what every good rabbi would do, when somebody would come and ask that kind of question, he would point them back to the Old Testament. And he would say to them, now, you, you've got the commandments that are out there, and if you will perfectly keep those commands, and without flaw and without failure, 
and do everything according to what the word says that you are to do and don't do, then you can have life. And it it is amazing how he responded. Watch this in verse 20. He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now, let's just pretend for a minute that I heard that scenario. I watched him as he ran up to Jesus. I watched him as he asked the question, and he's in this confrontation now with the Lord. And I heard Jesus say to him, uh, well, if you want to have life, then you know that you've got to keep the commandments. And then I listened to his response as he said, you know what, I, I, I must be in pretty good shape then because I've done all of that since I was a kid. And here's my response. If I were standing there listening to that, I would probably say, liar, liar, pants on fire. And and, and I would say, well, who in the world do you think that you are fooling? Now, I'll probably give you that you have not killed anybody. And I'll give you a pass on the fact that maybe you have not committed adultery. But I'm going to tell you, I bet you you stole a tent peg out of your neighbor's tent. Uh, Somewhere along the way, you took something that didn't belong to you. You stole somebody's idea. You stole somebody's vision. You took something that did not belong to you. And uh, somewhere along the way, you have exaggerated and lied. You got with your buddies, your rich pals, and y'all got to talk about all the stuff that you have. And you embellished the the number of camels that you got. and, And you said that you got more goats than what you really do possess. And, and, and you really went way beyond all, all of that. And this thing of honoring your mom and your daddy, what about that time that they told you to go feed the camels and behind their back you gave them that dirty look? If you're right, then we'll, make a, we, we'll weave a, a, a rug out of my back hair. I, I don't believe any of that stuff. I'm not buying it. Now, now <laughs> I got a visual right there I shouldn't have gotten. But anyway... Now, now, while I'm filleting this guy, while I'm deboning him, I want you to look at what Jesus did. The powerful, uh, powerful moment as Jesus treated him entirely different than what, what you and I would have been saying and doing. Watch verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him, whew, loved him. Now, now those of you that are here this morning that say you're saved, that say you have um, eternal life, that say you have a relationship to Christ, uh, can you see Jesus doing this? Can, can, Can you visualize this with me for just a minute? When he's looking beyond the sin, he's looking beyond the faults, he's looking beyond the failures, And he looks deep down into the souls of all of us. And he looks at us with compassion and with genuine love. Powerful moment right here. I don't want you to miss this. Powerful moment here. Colossians 1 says that Jesus was the visible expression of the invisible God. And so when we see Jesus as he's looking with compassion at this old boy, deep down into his soul, what we're doing is catching a glimpse of the very nature and the character of God himself. When we see this genuine love, do you know what you can know? Do you know what you can know when you see this? God loves you in spite of who you are. Now watch verse 21. And he said unto him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and take up your cross and follow me. (laughs) So he comes running up to Jesus. Jesus, um, how can I have eternal life And Jesus said, tell you what, go sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. And all of a sudden, this kid has whiplash. 
What? You've got to be kidding me. That's not what I wanted to hear. Well, I love this about Jesus. Because he wasn't giving it, and by the way, he doesn't do that with us either. He doesn't tell us what we want to hear, but he challenges us just like he did with the rich young ruler with truth. He confronted him with the truth. He didn't give him such, some easy peasy uh, spiritual plan to follow, but he raised the stakes and he gave them the truth about sacrifice. And he says, I want you to give up what is the most prized possession that you have in your life. I want you to sacrifice it. Now, let me be clear. I'm, I'm going to use a political term here, if that's all right. Uh, I hear this every morning. Well, let me be clear about this. But anyway, let me be clear. This is not suggesting that material possessions or money is evil. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the Bible does teach that the love of money, the love of possessions is what makes it evil. And, and, and if he was going to get what he was looking for, he had to come to the place that he was willing to give up and relinquish what he loved the most. Now, how did Jesus know that possessions and money was a barrier to keep him from having eternal life? How did he know that? Well, first of all, he's God, and he knows it all. But it could be that he watched him get down off of his Tahoe camel, dressed in the Brooks Brothers robe with the Armani sandals and headed his way. Might have been something along those lines. Watch verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved because he had great great possessions. Now here's one of those verses that you really want to get a little bit more technical about because what, what, do you, what does it mean sad-faced? Uh, I, I wanted to know what that expression meant. So I want to go a little bit deeper with you in just a minute. There, there are about a thousand different commentators that have a thousand different views of this. But, but, but here's the one, his face fell off. Uh, his face fell off. I, when, when I saw that, I, I, I thought about Raiders of the Lost Ark when they were chasing the Ark of the Covenant. They opened up the Ark of the Covenant and that old boy's face just melted. Do y'all remember the movie? Anyway, that, just, that was just me when I was looking at it. But, but his face fell off. But w when you dig down to the very root of what the Greek text really says here, it's pretty interesting uh, because uh, what it means is that there is a gathering cloud, there's an overcast sky that develops in anticipation of a coming storm, that sad face. The storm clouds gathered in anticipation of the storm. The overcast happened in anticipation of the storm. So he took the words of Jesus and he mixed it in with the other stuff of his life. And he came to the conclusion, I'm really not willing to go that far. And the Bible says that he walked away sad-faced. We think about the property that he owned, but listen, the fact of the matter is the property owned him. He was a prisoner to stuff that he wasn't willing to let go of in order to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch verse 23, and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished. Here we are in verse 24 now. We go back to the beginning of the text and the disciples were amazed and that amazement now has grown into astonishment. They were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto him, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It's easier for the largest beast in all of Palestine to go through the eye of a sewing needle than it is to enter into the kingdom of God as a rich person. Mm. 
They were astonished. Now, now here's, here's what you got to know about the culture. In this day, the amount of possessions was indicative of the blessing of God. The more property that you own, the more animals that you possessed, the richer that you were was just indicative to, in their mind that God loves them more, God blesses them more. It's the favor of God that is on their life. And so if he can't get in, if a man that is favored of God that much can't get in, if the blessings of God are on him and he can't get in, who in the world do we think that we are that we could get in? So the disciples got bent out of shape. Uh, they, they were really torn up uh, over this. Look at verse 27. And Jesus looking upon them with men, it is, well, verse 26, they were astonished without measure, saying among themselves, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them with men, it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Jesus said, hey guys, let me just tell you, you can't get to God on your own terms. It is humanly impossible for a person to gain access to the throne of God in their own terms. But if you come to God on his terms, then everything is possible for you. Nothing then when you come to God in his terms on his terms, then nothing is impossible. Now, what were the terms that God laid out for the rich young ruler? Pretty simply, God says to the rich young ruler, I want to be number one in your life. God says to me, I want to be number one in your life. God says to you, I want to be number one in your life. Those are his terms. Look at verse 28. Well, then Peter began to say uh, unto him, you know, we've left everything. We left it all. We followed you. Now, what you don't read in Mark's account is a little phrase that Matthew does include in his account. Simon Peter says, hey, um, I, I left a tremendous fishing business. My, my family was expecting me to run this family business there, and, and, and I had it made, and, and I left all of that behind. And Matthew says, to, what are we going to get out of it? That was his question. What are we going to get out of it? Now, Simon Peter says, now, Lord, uh, understand uh, I'm glad that I don't smell like halibut anymore. Um, and I love your teaching. And, and I love seeing you perform miracle after miracle. That, that is amazing. And, and Lord, frankly, I just like to be in your presence. But what's going to happen to me 25 years down the road because of what I've sacrificed now? What's in it for me? Come, come here, let me, let me share something with you. Look, look this way. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. I wish the rich young ruler had asked that question. Because that's a question that gets God into the equation. That, that, that's a question there that God could show up in the midst of it. Now, here we are. Uh, we're at the pinnacle of the message and I'm getting ready to pull in the conclusion and, and man, we're going to make a rapid descent in this thing. We're, we're kind of pictured like, like a roller coaster and uh, we're up here at the top and we're just about to go over and, and, and it's going to be a quick ride and you better hold on to your pancreas because, I mean, we're, we're in for this thing, okay? So, so here's the deal. Watch verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, 
houses, brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the world to come, eternal life. I, I want to tell you, that's a powerful statement. Jesus says, I assure you that whatever sacrifices that you give up so that I can be number one in your life, Whatever it is that you turn away from that you think is so important, but that very thing is hindering you from getting to God, and you turn your back on that so that you can get to God, I promise you I will restore it a hundredfold. Jay didn't say 100%. I'll restore it a hundred times over what you've given up. So let me illustrate. 100% would be, Don, I'm going to give you $5. Uh, it's an investment that I want you to make that will return you 100% what you invest. So Don invests the $5 and he gets 100% return. How much money does he get? $10. Okay. He's got $10. Now he's got his five and then he's got the 100%, five more. That's $10. God says, I'm on 100 times the $5. And, and I'm not a great mathematician, but you don't have to be to figure that one out. That's $500, see. A uh, 100 times, whatever it is you turn your back on that is hindering you from coming to God, I, I, I want you to know you're going to be rewarded in this life and you'll be rewarded with eternal life. God says if you sacrifice that relationship that you are in, that that relationship over here that you think is so important but you know in your heart of hearts because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to you that that relationship is hindering you from coming to faith in God and you sacrifice that relationship, I'll, I'll provide you more friends and more family than you could ever imagine. Powerful word. If you sacrifice that one habit that is destroying you now and is keeping you from God, God says, I'll give you a hundred things that won't destroy you, but it will enrich you like you've never been before in your life. Now, hear my heart a minute, because as your pastor, uh, I can't tell you when that's going to transpire. I can't tell you when it's going to take place. All I can tell you is our part is to sacrifice. It is God's part to multiply. That's his job. Verse 31, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. You know what? I, I don't mean to be ugly, but there's a lot of people strutting around today that give you the appearance of greatness that God has said, don't worry about those folks. They're going to be last. They may be first down here. They may have all of the appearance. They may strut spiritually down here. Imagine for just a minute, in your mind's eye, of walking up to Jesus and saying to Jesus, I want this eternal life. So Jesus, tell me what it is that I must sacrifice. Tell me what it is that I must give up and release. Now here's what I believe. I believe half the crowd in here that need to come to Jesus, half of you already know what the answer to that question is before you ever asked it. And I, I, I believe I'm resonating here because there was a lot of people that were shaking their head like that. You're exactly right. I know what it is that's keeping me from Jesus. I know what it is that's keeping me from uh, having this abundant life that God has promised. I know what it is. Now the other half of you, uh, you, you, you don't know what it is. Uh, you don't have a clue. So let me give you uh, a trigger or two 
that may stimulate your thinking. Uh, it could be a wrong relationship that you know that God doesn't want you in. It may be a friend out here that's hindering you from being the person that God wants you to be. And in order to become who God wants you to be, you know that you're going to have to sacrifice that relationship so that you can get to God. God says, I'll give you a hundred times more than what you ever had. Some of you, I, I see this more prevalent in men, but it's a growing phenomenon among women. You, you want to build this reputation. You want to build some kind of resume. And so you're giving everything that you have into the marketplace and you're trying to climb that corporate ladder because you want to have a life that you perceive is going to be successful and meaningful in the marketplace, but it's the very thing that is hindering you from being who God wants you to be. And God says, I want you to sacrifice that ego. And if you will, I'll give you so much more than what you ever imagined. You understand our part is to sacrifice. It's God's part to multiply. Substance abuse. Some of you are hooked right now on some drug. You may be a meth addict. You may be hooked on, God forbid, heroin. It's that substance abuse. It may be, it, it could be medical prescription medicines. But it's that very thing that you're, you think that you can't do without that's keeping you from getting to God. And he, he, here's what I'm going to ask those of you that are, that are involved in substance abuse. I, I want you to come to the place that you lay your ego down and you get to a friend of yours somewhere along the way and say, you know what, I can't deal with this. It's got a grip on me and I can't handle it anymore. Will you please help me get some help for it so that you can get to God? Be willing to give that up. 20 years ago, um, it was just all about religion for me. I, I, I look back and... And, you know, now I understand, not 20 years ago, but the first 20 years of my life, not 20 years ago, but the first 20 years of my life, it was all about religion. I, I didn't know it was about religion because I didn't know any better. Nobody had sat me down, taught me, and, and, and filled me in on that. But, but it was a, it was a, a regimen of do's and don'ts. And, and if my good can just outweigh my bad, th th then, then possibly God's going to that's, accept me. And, and I, I, that was all about, and I didn't realize then, but I realize so much more now, it's not about religion, guys, it's about relationship. God wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. And, and when I came to the place in my life at 20 years old that I realized, hey, th this is not about me working diligently to get the approval of God about my life, but it was about entering and engaging into a relationship with him. Then it affected every aspect of my life. It began to transform the way that I thought and the way that I acted and the way that I treated other people. Now, now here's the deal. You can make a decision in your life this morning to walk out of this building and be sad faced or you can go out of this building this morning and you're no longer going in the direction that's opposite of God you can walk out of this building going in the direction that God wants you to be and that choice is yours didn't, didn't you love the video Jen did a little bit ago isn't that powerful did you, I just was enamored at the look on her face and the, the, the joy that was there when she got a firsthand look at how God transformed her friend's life. Wow. What would your friend look like if God transformed them? I want to tell you, when we get serious about who's your one, when we get serious about our loved ones and our friends coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, when, when, when we get to seeing what 
God can do in their life, I promise you this, it'll be the most amazing thing that you've ever seen. It'll transform them and it'll do some amazing things in your life as well. While you're seated right now, I wonder how many of you would be willing this morning to lay down the things that are hindering you from being who God wants you to be and sacrificing them so that you could get to God. How, how many of you would be willing to do that? If you're willing this morning to admit, you know, I've got some wrong relationships. I, I, my, my life, is, it, it's really not going where I want it to go and I'm not being fulfilled in where I'm doing and, and I realize that my, my job and the friends that I'm keeping or whatever it is, this addiction issue that you're facing in your life, would you be willing just to say, you know what, I'm done with that? I want to get to God. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a minute. If, if that is your desire, I want you to pray something like this with me, right where you're seated. Would you pray, Heavenly Father, I really don't want anything to stand between me and you. And I know you want to be number one in my life and I want you to be number one in my life. Right now, Father, I'm willing to turn away from sin and self and receive you into my heart and into my life. Please forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. Save my soul. And Father, with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.